So, um, hello and welcome to uh, this lightning talk session. I'm Sushobit and I'm going to talk about uh, distributed tracing today. So, a quick show of hands if uh, people are aware of distributed tracing or have used in their projects. Okay, that's quite a bunch. Thank you. So, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, we have kind of developed a layer over our distributed. Uh, tracing um, solution where we collect uh, traces of unusual interest. For example, in the existing solution of our tracing, uh, that is Dapper based, Google's Dapper based, we have uh, the implementations as uh, Jaeger and Zipkin. What they essentially do is they kind of try to sample randomly some traces out of the bulk of the traces that we collect. And that's where the problem comes in, because when we say that we want uh, of traces of interest, what we mean is if there is a P0 issue or a SEV1 issue that we have, we should be able to know what the issue is, what are the underlying, um, what the underlying traces and matrix are pointing to, and effectively root cause the issue. By collecting uh, traces randomly, what we end up doing is we tend to collect traces which are of usual interest, like all the 200 OKs that we have. We try, we tend to collect all of them. The main attempt is to reduce all this and collect only the traces that are that possibly could point to the root cause of an issue. We'll go through the solution of how and what are the individual components that are part of this layer that I'm talking about. And, and yeah, we'll take it from there. So yeah, just from the basics, what is distributed tracing? So it's nothing but it's a technique used to monitor and manage complex systems, particularly in distributed computing environments today in the uh, ever-growing SaaS world, like microservice architecture. It uh, helps track the flow of requests as we move through various uh, components or servers within the system. So what are the components of distributed um, tracing that we can uh, list down? First is traces. So traces is nothing but it's a collection of individual units, what we call as span in the uh, tracing world. So span is essentially, I mean, the next topic is span. So span is an, essentially a unit of the trace where each API call that you make contributes to a span of the, uh, of the tracing world. So you can imagine trace as a collection of multiple uh, spans and associated with a single, I mean, linked to a single uh, ID known as the parent ID. So each trace has its own uh, parent ID, which points to a particular span. And that's how the linkage works. Trace aggregation, the linkage that I just spoke about that a uh, trace, uh, a span basically needs to, uh, needs to be combined together into a single entity that is the trace. And how do you aggregate that? That's part of this system that does the trace aggregation. Now next comes, how do I retain the traces? Because as I said, each API call contributes to a trace creation. So you can imagine the scale at which the big enterprises work and what are the number of API calls we track. We cannot simply track or even retain all of these traces. So that's where this sampling and retention uh, intelligence comes into picture. Now, uh, regarding the current uh, problem with the existing solutions that we could figure out is, with the traditional distributed tracing mechanism, we can only have max 5% trace uh, accommodated or retained. And that's also huge, like 5% when I say it's like, uh, it goes into petabyte scale if you are in a larger enterprise. And that's difficult to scrape through when there is a SEV1 issue. Second problem is the distribution today, when we say uh, we are sampling like say one to 5% of the traces, it's pretty random. It's like random sampling that may or may not capture the trace of interest when an issue occurs. and it's um, say it does not then i mean we are in kind of a soup that how do we solve the issue third problem is if we are using most of the solutions today are based on head based sampling so what it does is head based sampling essentially decides in the beginning of a 
trace that will it be retained or not like if it comes within the random sampling uh, limits it will capture it and retain it if it does not it will just uh, like throw it away and this does not ensure what type of trace it is. I mean, it does not go through the detail of that trace. Again, if we increase the sampling rate from say one to even 2%, that's double the storage that you would be needing. I mean, that is no concept of trace compression as say, because we need the whole view of it. So that's kind of a retention overhead or a memory overhead that will incur if we increase the sampling rate. Just to summarize, increase sampling rate, need more storage and lower sampling rate, you have to kind of lose out on your random sampling to capture trace of interest. Now comes the solution that we could uh, develop and how it works. So we use something known as a opposite of head-based sampling, that is a tail-based sampling. Now what that essentially does is that decides at the end of your event, that is the end of your trace creation, that should it be retained or not. And that intelligence is gained by a semi-supervised learning uh, algorithm that we are using that essentially creates a feature vector out of the whole trace that we collect. That includes your host name, the infra that it is coming from, the particular environment, let it be from say Prod1, US East1 or any environment that you are uh, concerned with and multiple other parameters which combine and form basically clusters and each cluster is having certain weight assigned to it. So when I say a weight assigned to a cluster, what I mean is, suppose there's a cluster, there are n number of clusters. Out of that, a particular cluster has some features which point to say environment, application name, and say the region. In this cluster, the number of traces that are associated with this cluster can have less of uh, US East 1 and more of US West 2, for example. That, what it will, that, uh, the weight of that particular cluster will ensure that it attracts traces. By attracts, I mean it retains traces that are more of US East 1 and less of US East 2 because it is kind of an inverse weight. The less the number of traces of that particular feature vector, the more it tries to capture. So yeah, that's what I mentioned, adaptive sampling engine uh, to assign specific rate uh, to collection of traces. So the feature vector that I just mentioned has these features. For example, there is operation method. It's a put, um, put, get, post, whatever method it is. The operation path. It has idea that what is the path it takes and it learns over time that, okay, these are my uh, paths and do I need to retain them or do I need to assign more weight to them or less weight to them? There is then service name because your cluster or the cluster points are self-aware of which cluster or what is the service it is associated with. Then there is span one, span two, span three, like n number of span host names, your status codes, your duration of the span, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So like this, we have like multiple feature vectors that are formed. Then there is this cluster data point that I mentioned. So each data point has a weight associated to it and Based on that, it attracts or repels a particular trace. Then the calculated weight, uh, which is the inverse weight of what the feature vectors are given. Suppose a feature vector is given more weight, then the chances of capturing that trace becomes low because the density is more of that trace already being present. Um, so this is what the whole architecture in a bird's eye view looks at. So for example, your microservice is there. It emits multiple traces and spans. Uh, sorry, uh, it emits multiple traces. It goes into a Kafka system where it essentially holds all the trace, all the traces together and stitches it, uh, forms the next span. And how do we ensure a span is legal or not? Is that we see what is the parent ID of that span. If a parent ID is not generated, that essentially means that trace never got completed or it was like interrupted midway. So that essentially gives us the layer that is that trace even a genuine trace or not. Then that basically goes into the span aggregator, which creates the uh, span out of all the traces. Then it goes to a system known as the adaptive sampler. Adaptive sampler talks again to a separate system that is the trace cluster. The trace cluster gives you idea of the 
averaged out or the uh, weighted average of what traces and what is the rate of that trace should be assigned. For example, if you have a trace coming in and your adaptive sampler gives the uh, weight of say uh, 0.9 out of 1, that essentially means that's a trace of interest and that should be captured or retained in the system for further use. So that's the intelligence that uh, this trace clusterer provides over, overall. And yeah, then after that, whatever is your storage going forward, you store it in that. So that's more or less the solution of the intelligence layer that we have over the tracing. The tracing can be anything here. The trace system that we use can be anything here. It's just a layer over your tracing system that uh, this solution works on. So yeah, thanks for your patience and I'm um, happy to take questions if there are any. Yeah, so we have written a software for it. We are in the process of open sourcing it now. So it's like you collect the traces, that software does the stitching part of it and forms a span out of it and then sends it to your uh, that decisive layer of storing or not. So that's a software that we have written, but it's in the process like, I'm hoping by this end of, before end of this year, we should be able to open source that completely. The sampling rate, you mean? Yeah, the weight. The weight, yeah. The weight is automatically assigned. So the the, the trace uh, cluster or the adaptive sampler component that you see, right? That has all the feature vectors it requires. It generates. There's a formula that generates the particular weight. Basically, what that formula does is crunches all the distributions and basically it gives the type of trace that you have a certain weight associated. It's not a manual. It's, Yeah, so based on all the feature vectors we have, right? You have the host name, you have the region, you have the application name. For example, your application one is more prone to uh, having some issue or say generating 400 uh, status codes. In that case, it will look for the other clusters. It will look that, okay, my application one has 400 in a particular, does not have this trace of interest of 400 in any of the other clusters. So let me assign a more weight to this. That essentially ensures that your application one with a particular so, uh, status code is uh, captured. It's me who defines like uh, what is used like a feedback. So like if you want to say so based on the status code, please do this way uh, lower or The system learns over time. Like it's not that we have to define it. It learns from the data that we have. So it's a, uh, we have used, used some algorithm known as the density based scanning. Okay. So the, the, this weight what you have is feed is fed into the system and it learns over time that okay my this system needs this much weight and say tomorrow I have this 400 okays uh, I mean 400 status code more in number automatically that learns and gives it a lower weight so going the correct yes cool okay thank you thanks a lot for your patience